question. Um, the first question, uh, which of the following characterizes Shah Ismail the first's approach to Islam? So we've got four choices, right? He was a supporter of the Mevlana Sufi order, frequently visiting the Yeshil Turbe in Konya, which is a modern day Turkey. Um, he was a supporter of the Asharite uh, Sunni Islam. And upon conquering Baghdad, he rebuilt the Beit al-Hikmah. Um, uh, number C, he was an Izari Ismaili Shiite claiming to be a living Imam. And D, he was a heterodox Shiite asserting views of being a quasi divine entity. Now I have a comment in the chat that the answer is D. And D is correct. Um, the it's all um, now. Uh, the person who wrote that wrote, uh, but C is pretty interesting though. Um, there is a living imam of the Nizari Ismaili Shiite school, um, and this has been a tradition. There are some of the Shiite schools whose caliph or imam um, still exists to this day. And the Nizari Ismailis are among them. Um, so they actually have an imam. He lives in Lisbon, Portugal. Um, and his name is, uh, or rather his regnal name is Aga Khan IV. Um, and yeah, so he visits Nizari Ismailis all over the world. There's about 15 million of them. Um, and tries to negotiate on their behalf, sort of like a pope, uh, if you can imagine a pope for that small of a population. All right, so question number two. Which of the following were, uh, were regions that Shah Ismail I conquered before the Battle of Chaldiran in 1514? Choose all that apply. We've got Eastern Anatolia, Central Anatolia, Mesopotamia, North Caucasus, Persia, Afghanistan, and Khwarezm. Come on, no guesses? All right, C is one of them. F is another one. Keep going, Arlene. <laughs> All right, so um, the answers are Eastern Anatolia, Mesopotamia, Persia, and Afghanistan. Um, the other regions that were listed here, Central Anatolia, the North Caucasus, and Khwarezm, were outside of the area that the Safavid Empire uh, expanded to. So question number three, why did Shah Tahmasp create the Kurchi? And we've got four choices. Uh, Shah Tahmasp wanted to help the Mughal king Humayun regain his throne and created the Qurchi as his personal ambassadors to negotiate for this. The Qurchi were the first divisions of the Safavid military to use firearms. The Qurchi were brought in, to, uh, brought in to fill the administrative void because neither the Shah nor the Kizil. <laughs> Richard? Yeah. Can you hear me? What just yeah. happened? Uh, yeah, we, ju we, we just had a Zoom bomber, but I think everything's fine. Um, so, yeah, so I have a comment that D is the correct answer, and that is correct. The Qurchi had exclusive loyalty to the Shah, which provided a military counterweight to the Qizil Bash. That's, that's completely correct. All right. Question number four. Do you guys all still hear me? Oh yeah, Richard. We can hear you. Richard. Okay, is perfect. that person is that person still here? Because we can remove him. Um, I thought I removed him. Oh, okay. All right. Thank okay. you. Uh, which three of the following statements about uh Naqsh Jahan Square are true? 
So its primary function was to keep the Shah isolated from commerce, commoners and duties of governance and accordingly was cordoned off from the local population. It is located in Isfahan primarily for the purpose of trade. It contains the Ali Kapu Palace and Shah Mosque, famous for its mirror work. It contains the Chahal Sutun Palace with its depictions of the Battle of Chaldiran. It is notable for having well-tiled bathhouses and frescoed marketplaces. It was constructed primarily during the reign of Shah Abbas I the Great. Um, it, the blue color of some of its structures was based on materials from local quarries. And three of these statements are true. Three of these statements, or sorry, yeah, three of these statements are false. Four of these statements are false. So let's see. I've got B, C, and E. Uh, B and C are correct. E is not correct. Everybody is struggling with the last one. It's F, uh, that it was constructed primarily during the reign of Shah Abbas the Great, uh, and then B and C are correct. Um, A is incorrect because it was open to everybody, including the common people. Uh, D is incorrect because Jahal Sutun and the Battle of Ch uh, Jahal Sutun is located in Kazvin, which is in the north of Iran. Um, E is incorrect because that was the Ganjali complex, which is uh, further east uh, in the city of Kerman. Um, and G is incorrect because um, the blue color came from Ardabil, which was in the far north of the Safavid Empire and was brought there specifically because uh, Shah Abbas had reconquered Ardabil, the historic origin place of the Safavids, and it was a statement of uh, returning home. All right, and question number five, the last question. How did the Shiite clergy in general react to their empowerment under Shah Hussein? So we have A, Sheikh Ul Islam Muhammad Bakr Majlisi created, led the creation of a Shiite clerical administration and began to culturally transform Iran. Leaders among the Shiites reiterated the 12 or Shiite, that 12 or Shiite Islam rejects terrestrial power without the presence of the 12th Imam. Leaders among the Shiites began forming regional sects by establishing schools like the Khan Academy in Shiraz, Iran, and Sheikh Ul Islam Muhammad Bakr Majlisi made it his goal to eradicate traditional practices like self-flagellation uh, on 10th Ashura. And I have A in the comments, and A is correct. Um, uh, uh, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Ul Islam Muhammad Bakr Majlisi not only created um, a Shiite uh, clerical administration, he began to enforce uh, Shiite uh, cultural behaviors uh, like the self-flagellation on 10th of Ashura. And he began to instigate pogroms against all religious minorities in Iran, um, including uh, non-Islamic, uh, non-monotheistic groups like Hindus and Zoroastrians, um, non-Muslim uh, people of the books like Christians and Jews and including against uh, Sunnis and Sufis as well. So um, it, was, uh, it, it, was, it was a complete repudiation of most historic Twelver Shiite belief that, uh, that Twelvers should not have a role in governance. It completely changed uh, this idea. And uh, we can see echoes of this in the current Islamic Republic of Iran um, where Shiites outside of Iran um, are still questioning whether or not such a government is, uh, where the Ayatollah has this kind of power, is politically acceptable, religiously acceptable uh, within uh, 12 or Shiite Islam. Okay, so now we're going to get to what we're here for. All right, so when, when we talk about Armenia, we're talking about this geographic raised area, right? So if we look at the topographic map on the right-hand side, we see that there are two mountain ranges in the eastern part of Anatolia, you have the eastern Pontic range and the southeastern Taurus. And between those ranges, you have an incredibly high and mountainous area uh, called the Armenian Plateau. Now, the Armenian Plateau um, is a relatively um, difficult area to farm. Uh, you can grow grass and you can grow grapes and other crops that can exist in that sort of hardy environment. Uh, but where you really get fertility is around the lakes. And you can see that there are really two lakes uh, in that Armenian Plateau region. The first one at the edge of the southeastern Taurus 
is the larger lake. It's Lake Vaughan. And if you look closer to the Lesser Caucasus Mountains in the upper right-hand side of that oval, um, you have Lake Sevan. These two lakes, Lake Vaughan and Lake Sevan, are important to remember because these become sort of the cultural focal points of Armenian civilization. We then see that there are several rivers that, uh, that flow through the area. Uh, probably the most prominent in the western part of Armenia is the Euphrates. The Euphrates has its sources in the Armenian plateau. And in the eastern side, we have the Aras River or the Arax River that starts in the plateau and ends in the Caspian Sea. Uh, today, the, uh, the Arax River uh, forms the boundary between Armenia and Azerbaijan on the northern side and Iran on the southern side. Um, but, in, but at various points in time, uh, the Aras River either was or was not a boundary, uh, politically speaking. Another part that I sort of want to bring to attention is that when we talk about Armenia, especially as we talk about it today, we're talking about sort of that area in the oval. We're talking about this Armenian plateau and the people who are living there. So if you look at the modern day map that I've got on the left-hand side, the majority of that territory is in the modern nation state of Turkey. Um, and so I just wanna be clear that when I talk about Armenia, I'm talking about areas that are not exclusively within the modern country of Armenia. And I'll use the term post-Soviet Armenia to refer to the modern country. And if I just say Armenia, I'm referring to that oval, all those areas where um, Armenians make up either a sizable population or have a historic vested interest. All right, so when we talk about the countries that have historically been Armenian countries, there are sort of four different Armenias that we talk about in the historical spectrum. If we look on the lower left-hand side of this picture, um, we see a country um, called that's labeled here as Artaxiad Armenia. And um, that's its biggest uh, set of borders, and we're gonna explain what that is. Um, but that is the first major kingdom that is clearly identified as Armenian. There, we're going to talk about other kingdoms that preceded it, of course. Um, we also talk about our Sassid Armenia, um, which came in the first and fifth centuries. And then in the next session, we'll talk about Bagratid and Rubinid Armenia, as well as subsequent forms. The modern country of Armenia recognizes all four of these civilizations as previous versions and iterations of Armenia. And which is why if you look at the coat of arms in the center, the coat of arms reflects the symbols of all four of these states. So one of the things that's important to point out, especially uh, if we look at this from a linguistic perspective, is that the Caucasus is one of the most diverse regions in the world in terms of language. Um, and you typically see this when you get to mountain ranges um, because peoples that existed in a plains area nearby when they were suffering from persecution would flee to the mountains. And mountains, historically speaking, were much more difficult to occupy and control than, uh, than local plains regions. And that really only changes in the 20th century. Uh, with modern uh, military equipment and the ability to transport uh, that modern military equipment effectively into the mountains um, and air supremacy. So as a result, we have five major language families that sit uh, in the Caucasus region. Um, the most uh, famous probably are the Indo-Europeans. And right, Armenian is an Indo-European language. We'll sort of discuss a little bit about what that means. But um, the other Indo-European languages in the region uh, are coming from the south, right? Persian is an Indo-European language. And from, the, and, the, and from the far north, Russian is also an Indo-European language. That said, Armenian is very different from both Russian and uh, on one side, and Persian or Kurdish, or Ossetian or Talish, which are all in the Iranic family on the Southern side. So um, you have, even within the Indo-European tree in this area, very different languages. Um, but outside of this, we also have uh, today, Turkic languages, of course, that only uh, came in about a thousand years ago. And we talked about some of that um, around the seventh and uh, 11, 7th and 9th no, 7th and 10th um, uh, presentations in this series. You also have a number of groups that are exclusively in this region. These are Caucasian languages um, and don't exist anywhere else in the world. Um, 
except for wherever these people, uh, if they were expelled from the Caucasus at a later point, have moved, right? Mm -hmm. These these uh, these languages aren't represented anywhere else. Um, and in many cases, they have some of the most difficult grammars to learn for non-native speakers um, because they never were standardized or organized until the 20th century. So, of course, the biggest of these is Georgian. Uh, Georgian is its own unique uh, language family. And we also have other families. You can see, if you look at the map, you have the Dagestani family, you have the Abkhaz family, you have the Vainakh family, um, a lot of different groups. And you can also see that uh, uh, Farsi, uh, Far Farsi isn't listed here, um, but it would be uh, in the Kurdish areas um, uh, or just to the south of them. Uh, people people were speaking Farsi in this area, but it wasn't, uh, yeah, but it was probably more south of where this map is. That's why you don't see it. Um, as for um, the other Caucasians, um, the only language on here that I that really jumps out to me is a language that has uh, escaped the Caucasus, that is a Caucasian uh, dominant language, is um, Adige or Cherkes. Um, which are the languages of the Circassian people, and that's because the Circassians uh, were expelled from their historical homeland about 300 years ago. Um, when we say, uh, I have a question of how different are Caucasian and Indo-European languages, and the answer is extremely. Um, I think that the best way to understand it is try to compare uh, a, a European language to Chinese. Like we're, like we're talking about completely different grammatical structures. We have uh, completely different lexicons. Um, there is no mutual intelligibility on even the most basic of words and no common origin um, linguistically uh, that's less than 10,000 years ago. Um, so completely unintelligible if you don't know, uh, if you don't know anything about these languages. Um, the Russians who did standardize them in the 20th century spent decades learning them in order to standardize them. Uh, that should give you an idea about just how different they are um, from uh, the languages that surround them in the larger nation states. All right, now we've talked about all these different groups. If we burrow down to the Armenian language itself, um, Armenian has historically been divided into two major groups. Uh, East Armenian um, or the Om dialects and West Armenians or the G dialects. Um, and this division occurred roughly where the border between the Ottoman Empire and the, and the Safavid Persian Empire that we talked about last week, uh, where that border fell in the Treaty of Amasya of 1555. Now, <laughs> um, now, the important the reason why it looks weird with the borders that are drawn here is that the borders that are drawn here are from 1909 when Russia con when uh, the Tsarist Russia had conquered a part of what's now the Ottoman Empire in the northeast, um, and so that uh, Erzurum uh, re region is in uh, quote Russian control, even though today that region is entirely within Turkish borders and had been uh, prior to the Russian conquest in 1868. So, but these dialects have uh, several key differences. You can see if you look at the words below, one of them is that the Eastern dialect tends to favor uh, a P over a B, um, a T over a D, and a G over a K. Uh, in each case, uh, these are typical, uh, with, with uh, with the T and the P, these are weaker sounds, and with the G, it's a harder sound. Um, but uh, so you can see these words are somewhat different. Also, because of the last, let's say, 300 years um, of significant Russian influence um, in the Eastern dialects and significant Turkish influence on the Western dialects, um, there are numerous loan words from those languages um, in uh, each of these Armenians. So. Um, Armenians from West Armenia and Armenians from East Armenia can generally communicate. There is a linguistic intelligibility, but there is a strong accent that each one hears. And if a person is not accustomed to hearing an Armenian speaker of the other Armenian uh, category, um, they might find it more difficult to understand them. Um, similar to how 
um, people might struggle if they hear an inner city accent from the United Kingdom and they don't have exposure um, outside of the United States. Um, for those of you who are excited about the Kardashians, uh, I unfortunately do not share in that level of enthusiasm. Um, so uh, unless the Kardashians do something that is actually historically momentous, uh, they will not be featured in my presentations. Um, so now if you look at the Indo-European family tree, um, and this of course is a very rigorous scientific model that I got from uh, a history textbook. Um, you can see that Armenian is this branch off to the side, completely unrelated to anything else, right? You've got uh, on the upper right-hand side, you have the Indo-Aryan branch, and you've got your Germanic branch, you've got your uh, Celtic branch, you've got all these different things going on. Um, I, yeah, I didn't even know I could do that, but there we go. The tree is enlarged. So if you see on the upper right-hand side, you have that Indo-Aryan branch. Um, you've got your West Germanic branch. You've got your um, Slavic branches. Um, you've got your Romance branches. Uh, and um, at, as you can see, um, practically nothing aside from Armenian is just sort of on its own and not connected to anything. All right. All right, so we also saw a little bit about how other Caucasians dress. So I thought it only fitting uh, to show Armenian national dress. And of course you can see um, the Armenian national dress differs all across um, the historic areas in which Armenians have lived. Some of which are within uh, Armenia and some of which are outside of Armenia even, right? For example, if you look at the, one, the Armenians in the lower left-hand side of that map, they are at, uh, in the area called Cilicia, um, and we're not going to discuss that much today because that's going to be more um, next week. But that's an area outside of traditional Armenia, but where Armenians ended up creating a country of their own. Um, so you have all these different dresses and Armenians today, of course, dress in typical Western attire, but they still have their traditional dress uh, and they will use that in celebrations and festivities. All right. So now we start to get a little bit more to the history of it. So the Armenians have four possible origin uh, situations and I'm just gonna sort of lay them out and you can sort of figure out what you think of them and, and uh, how valid they are. Of course, the first one is the one that the Armenians themselves asserted is their uh, tradition and origin myth According to um, Armenian myth and legend, there was a patriarch hike, um, and he was able to conquer Armenian, uh, the Armenian plateau from this tyrant, uh, Bel, in 2492 BCE. Um, I believe it's October the 1st. Uh, um, um, and the reason this date is so specific is because the church leaders have calculated it based on the amount of years that all the biblical characters would have lived and so forth and so on. Uh, this is based on the allegation or, or, or belief that Hike is the great, great grandson of Noah, uh, right? Noah had a son, Japheth. Japheth had a son, Gomer. Gomer had a son, Togarma. And Togarma had a son, Hike. All of the first four individuals are in the Bible. Hike himself is not listed in the Genesis uh, account of Noah's uh, descendants. Now, there is very little reason to believe that there was civilization in the Armenian highlands about 5,000 years ago, um, to the extent that we are aware of it. It looks like there were small tribes and groups, but the idea of a national entity uh, being there is rather small. Now, one of the earlier um, views from outside of Armenia was from the ancient Greeks, and the ancient Greeks argued uh, that there was a migration of Phrygians. Now, Phrygians are people that exist and that existed um, about 3,000 years ago, a little bit a little bit before then, in what's now Western Turkey. Um, so these Phrygians moved east into the Armenian highlands um, and they began to settle there. That was, that was the Greek, uh, ancient Greek explanation for where the Armenians came from. Um, 
the dominant explanation by scientists, archaeologists, and philosophers in the 20th century was this idea of the Armen tribe, that there was a group of people that existed around where Phrygia was, um, and these were, a, uh, these were a tribe called the Armans, and the Armans moved into uh, the Armenian plateau uh, after the fall of Urartu, and we're going to discuss what that means, um, around 590 BC, and they mixed with uh, other tribal confederations in the region that did not speak their language, like uh, the, uh, the Hayasa Azi Confederation or the Nairi or um, any number, uh, and the Hurrians, any number of differently speaking Caucasian people, right? We've already talked about how the Caucasus is the most linguistically, the most linguistically diverse or one of the most linguistically diverse places in the world. Um, it was no different at this time, right? And these, uh, these other um, speakers, uh, from the Hayasa Azi Confederation, the Hurrians, they speak language families that don't even exist anymore. So that was the dominant theory in the 19th and 20th centuries, and it has become less favorable in the 21st century, but it's still, it's still a serious contender. And the, and the most recent theory is this idea of interchangeability, that Armenians and Urartuans are either two terms for the same thing, or the, Ruart, or the Urartuans um, included within their confederation Armenians, um, even though the Armenians and the Armenian language were not the dominant uh, members of the Ruartuans until the later days of their empire. Okay, so if we, uh, and we can see there's evidence for this on both sides of, uh, on all sides of these issues, right? For example, if we look at uh, Behistun, which is um, sort of the Iranian equivalent of the Rosetta Stone, right? You've got this massive mountain. Um, Darius has decided to put up his edicts um, uh, of his conquest throughout, uh, throughout the Middle East, and he carved it in the mountain in three languages, right? He carved it in Persian, he uh, carved it in Akkadian, um, and um, there was one other language he used. I don't remember which one. But what's important is that in... Uh, the, for example, in the Akkadian text, he refers to the land as Urashtu, right, uh, which is clearly a version of Urartu. But if you look at the old Persian uh, text on the same text, right, it's just a translation. It's it's all carved into one mountain. Um, they on the Achaemenid side, sorry, on the sorry, when they wrote it in old Persian, they wrote it as Armina, right. So they're referring to the same country in the same part of the text. Um, by two different names in the two different languages, which leads some credence to the idea that Urartu and Armenia are two different names for the same entity. We also have, for example, um, the uh, Sargon Cylinder. Um, and and the, the Sargon Cylinder was written by the Assyrians and they label the country as Urartu also. Um, now, the term Urartu is something that uh, should look relatively familiar uh, if you're familiar with the Bible, in that it has the same consonantal formation as Ararat, right? The, the great mountain where Noah's Ark supposedly landed. And so Urartu is just the Assyrian rendering of the term. So it might not even be the name that the Urartuans called their own country. It was simply the mountain by which they were identified by others. So, and even today, the Armenians do not call themselves Armenians. They call themselves Haik. After this legendary founder, Haik, they call themselves Hai. So um, the term Armenian is itself uh, an external name that's applied to them. Similarly to the way that Germans don't call themselves Germans, they call themselves Deutsch. Um, yes, uh, I, I think that uh, responding to the question of, is this why uh, they claim this ancestry from Noah? I think that it's sort of a, a way, yes, it's a way to link them to the mountain. And I think it's also a way for them to link themselves to the Bible as Christianity becomes more and more important in Armenian self-definition. All right. So if uh, if we talk a little bit about uh, the story of Hike. So um, the story of Hike is that 
he was rebelling against this Babylonian tyrant named Bel. And you can see Bel in the picture on the left-hand side and the right-hand side at different stages in his life. Now, Hike uh, gathered his kinsmen together and he was an excellent bowman. He was able to rally them together to fight against the Babylonian tyrant. Now, it's not even that this tyrant was himself that powerful. He had allies among the giants, right? The, in the Bible, these are called Nephilim, right? These uh, fallen massive creatures. And so the Babylonian tyrant was able to raise these giants as enemies to Hike. But of course, Hike, because of his uh, bravery and uh, intrepid nature, was able to rally his kinsmen and defeat uh, the Babylonian tyrant after the great battle of giants, which in Armenian is called Tutsaznamart. Uh, um, so on August the 11th, 2492 BCE, um, he created an open tomb um, and buried Bel, um, consecrating the nation of Armenia. And you can see in the picture, uh, in the painting of the tomb, you can see the arrow uh, in Bel's heart. Of course, that was the arrow launched by Haik uh, to kill him uh, in this uh, great battle of giants. You can also see other symbols of Armenian identity in the picture, right? You can see um, the picture of Noah's Ark resting on Mount Ararat. You can see uh, Hike holding his bow, that symbol of his power. And you can see a map um, of historic Armenia so, um, uh, uh, slowly falling to the ground, right? Um, so you have this story of Hike. You also have other mythical stories that after Hike, um, the Armenian kingdom was ruled by this King Ara. And Ara was known as a handsome king. So he got the name King Ara the Handsome. And he was a respectable um, and well-liked uh, ruler of the Armenians. Uh, he was married at that time to his queen, Navard. But um, the Assyrian queen, uh, Semiramis, uh, really desired his heart. And so she declared war on Armenia in order to force him to abdicate his throne and become uh, her, uh, her husband. He refused, uh, of course, her hand in marriage because he was already married and he was an honorable person. Um, and in the battle, uh, Queen Semiramis ends up killing, or rather her troops end up killing uh, King Ara the Handsome. So she takes him into her secret area and um, she is a sorceress. So she uses her magical powers um, to resuscitate him. Um, uh, he she uses her magical powers to resuscitate him, and she takes the resuscitated zombie uh, king back home with her, um, and she transfigures one of uh, her soldiers to look like King Ara, um, and that soldier makes peace with her, right? Of course, there's no reason to believe um, that any of these stories actually took place, right? The story of Hike or the story of Ara and Queen Semiramis, but they play a huge part in developing the Armenian central consciousness of being a nation that they have these uh, constructive stories of how their nation came to be, right? If we move towards a more historical perspective, um, we have the kingdom of Urartu, um, which was known in their own language as Bianili, between the ninth and sixth centuries BC. And you can see that um, Urartu is on this map is in the yellow area. And this is a map from around the year 700 BCE. So towards the end of the empire. Um, but um, you can see that the areas that they central as, uh, that they have as their center are Lake Vaughan and uh, Lake Sevan and a small bit on, on Lake Urmia. And to their south, they have Assyria. And much of Urartu's relationship and uh, historical interaction is in relation to Assyria. Now, the way Urartu really begins is um, as a number of... Yeah. Um, Urartu defines itself um, primarily through this opposition to Assyria, right? So you have these uh, a number of different tribes in the Armenian highlands. We don't know what languages they speak because they didn't write very much. But we're inclined to believe that they were not uh, kinsmen because they had such difficulty uniting under one banner. Um, but as Armenian attacks against these tribes become more and more intense, they begin to unite under one banner. Now, 
it seems like they had a pre-existing religion of sorts. Um, and, and this religion revolved around a creator god named Khaldi. You can see Khaldi um, on the stella on the right-hand side. And you can and uh, Khaldi was part of a trinity with the goddess uh, Tesheba and the goddess Shivini. Um, uh, Tesheba um, tended to be a goddess of fertility um, and storms. Um, now those gods together um, were seen in their pantheon. And this pantheon was a different pantheon than the one that the Assyrians worshiped. Um, so yeah, it's, it seems like a unique religion. Now, in terms of what was the economy and livelihood of the people of Bianili, of Urartu, um, we see several different things going on. The first one is that this land becomes well known for breeding uh, effective horses. Um, the high altitude means that these horses have incredible lung capacity and they're also incredibly hardy animals because they have to go up and down all these different hills and slopes. Accordingly, um, there's always uh, a great amount of trade between Armenia or whoever controls the Armenian highlands and the lowland peoples who have great need and use of these horses. There's also an incredible amount of livestock um, that comes from the mountains. Uh, bulls were especially uh, famous and uh, well-respected. Um, they, uh, they were also sheep herders and uh, purveyors of wool in terms of trade. But probably the most important contribution of uh, Urartu is the, uh, ex uh, the exportation of mineral ore, iron, bronze, silver, gold. These things were quite uh, plentiful in the mountains and quite uh, rare in the lowland regions, especially like those controlled by Assyria um, or by um, uh, or on um, or in any of the other uh, major areas where civilization happened. Um, I have a question as to whether the, uh, the Urartuans were depicted um, on the walls of uh, Persian architecture. The, they absolutely were. Um, uh, by the time of the Achaemenids, uh, the Urartuan civilization didn't exist. So we're talking about Armenians at this point. But um, yes, they are. Uh, there are places, for example, in Persepolis where the, you have the depiction of the 20 nations that um, the Persians believe themselves to be the rulers of as king of kings. And among them are the Armenians. And we, I actually have a picture of them later in the presentation. So now when, when we get back to geography, there are a few places that I want to point out because we're going to see them a few times, right? So in the uh, starting from north to south, we have the city of Erebuni. Erebuni uh, was first built by King Argishti, um, and it was built as a fortress on the northern edge of Urartu. Of course, Erebuni is known much better by its modern name, Yerevan, and it's the modern capital of post-Soviet Armenia. Um, but at the time that Argishti built it, it was a northern extremis, right? It was the edge of the kingdom uh, to defend against uh, Georgians and uh, Georgians from the north, right? We have the civilizations of Colchis uh, and Imereti, and, uh, but these are all Georgian peoples. Um, you can see also Mount Ararat. We've talked about Mount Ararat. You can see a picture on the left-hand side of what the mountain looks like topographically. It's really striking relative to the other uh, areas around it. Um, we then have the city of Tushpa. Uh, Tushpa is now known as the city of Van in Eastern Turkey. Um, and Tushpa becomes really the first stable capital of Urartu. And we also have the city of Musasir. We don't know exactly where it is, but the most, uh, but most researchers are inclined to believe that the city of Musasir is in the modern uh, Iraqi Kurdish city of Rawandiz, or very close to it. Um, also, I put up that idol so you can get a sort of a sense of how Urartuans uh, saw themselves, right? Because their idols were modeled on what they thought a human looked like. And so that's, yeah. So you have these confederations, right? You, um, uh, that are existing in the mountains. And uh, King Arame is the first king of the Nairi. 
uh, and we use this term Nairi because that's what the Assyrians referred to them as. And the Assyrians made several invasions of their territory in order to recover either their lands or their mineral wealth. Um, and these uh, invasions under King Shalmaneser III of Assyria led to these Nairian tribes uniting uh, under King Arame. Now, you may notice that the King Arame, the name sounds very similar to King Ara, and it's believed by many historians that the story of King Arame was the inspiration for the, for the mythical tale of King Ara. Now, in order to keep the Assyrians out and secure the country, he began to build the citadel of Tushpa, which you can see in the lower left-hand side. Obviously, this is a more recent reiteration building of that structure, but that citadel really protected Lake Vaughan and therefore effectively meant that there was a food source that would allow uh, Urartu to flourish as a country. Now, we also don't know what the succession system was of Urartu. We are inclined to believe that it's a hereditary monarchy, but there are some indications to, uh, to indicate that King Sarduri I, who was one of the successors to King Arame, was not genetically related to him and may have been from another member of the confederation, which means that there may have been some kind of vote sharing mechanism or some kind of um, appointment by different tribes and vassals. The relationship between these various peoples may have actually been very complicated and difficult. King Surduri I also was involved in building many defensive structures all around the kingdom in order to prevent further Armenian, uh, sorry, further Assyrian invasion. Now, you then had uh, after uh, King Sarduri uh, was he was followed by King Ishpuini. And King Ishpuini was able to not only defend against Assyria, but to take advantage of that empire's weakness and expand further south, right? We noticed that Musasir was further south than any of the areas um, controlled previously by the Nairi. And so they conquered the city and they saw the temple of Khaldi, um, which they also augmented and incorporated into their belief structure. It's at this point that uh, that the religious system of the uh, Urartuans becomes more and more solidified. Um, somebody's asking if it was that yellow. I think uh, that's a reconstruction to show how gold it was. Although the color looks a little off, I will agree. Um, but because uh, we haven't actually found the site of Musasir, so we don't actually know what it would look like. But this is sort of the estimation based on uh, the sources that we have. Um, and Musasir really became a holy city to the Urartuans. Um, they had a number of traded religious processions um, and consecrated priests to live in the city. But its position on the southern part of uh, Urartu made it a prime target for uh, the Assyrians. And so uh, during the reign of King Rusa I, which was about 100 years later, give or take, um, Sargon II, of Assyria led an attack on the country and he uh, sacked uh, Musasir and burnt it to the ground. You can see actually, this is a picture um, left by Sargon II um, of that destruction. During the same period of time, Rusa I had to deal with uh, invasions from the north from a nomadic people called the Sumerians. Um, we don't know an incredible amount about them, but we know that they were an Iranic speaking people similar to the Scythians. Uh, and they'd come from the north, uh, the area north of the Caucasus. So the Urartuans were really pinned in uh, by both sides. They were pinned in from the Assyrians to the south and by these nomadic Sumerians to the north. Between the reigns of Ishpuini and, uh, and Rusa I, there was the reign of King Argishti I. Um, and King Argishti I has taken a unique position uh, in post-Soviet uh, Armenia because of his construction of Erebuni. Right. So in 782, he builds uh, this uh, fortress of Erebuni outside of what's uh, what's now the modern city of Yerevan. I think Yerevan has caught up to where Erebuni was. And he wrote um, in Akkadian, right, um, that he was uh, going to instill fear in the neighboring countries and by the will of Khaldi that he had achieved it. Right. But, so we have this um this uh, this massive construction and parts of 
the fortifications of Erebuni still exist. You can see that picture in the upper right-hand side showing some of the edges of the walls um, of Erebuni in post-Soviet Armenia. All right, so Urartu survived, as we pointed out, for nearly three centuries and really came to an end um, as the Medes became a dominant force in regional politics, right? You can see the Medes on this map in green. And the Assyrians had recently been conquered by the Neo-Babylonians. In fact, the Medes, Sumerians, and Neo-Babylonians had been working together as a confederation to overthrow the Assyrians. And by the year 608 BCE, they had finally defeated the last Assyrian uh, pretenders at the Battle of Haran and were able to concentrate uh, their forces against Urartu. Um, so um, what's interesting to point out in this period is actually that Urartu had become a vassal state of Assyria in the previous century. And because they had become a vassal state of Assyria, now the enemies of Assyria had made uh, Urartu their enemy, where uh, historically, of course, we kept pointing out that, Assyri that Assyria was the primary enemy of Urartu. Uh, and it simply came to the fact that because the Assyrians couldn't hold the territory, uh, they were more than uh, they were willing to extract wealth from it uh, as a vassal state uh, since they couldn't impose themselves. So we also have a number of myths and legends about, uh, about Urartu in this period as well, right? Um, you have the story of Jason and the Argonauts. Um, you have Arminus of Thessaly um, as one of the members of Jason's Argonauts. Um, and of course, Arminus was a Greek rendering of Armenia. You also have um, the story of Zamair, Zormeir. And Zormeir was, um, according to Armenian sources, one of the generals uh, who defended Troy uh, from the from the Greeks who were attacking in the Iliad. Um, on the Greek side, he is not mentioned. So when the Medes um, are overthrown, uh, when the Medes are overthrown by the Persians, right? This is uh, Cyrus the Great uh, launches a revolt against his father and takes the country. Um, he then manages to expand uh, the Achaemenid Empire all the way to the edges of Greece in the west, uh, Egypt in the southwest, and Persia, uh, all the way to India and Central Asia in the east. And so you have all these territories or satraps, uh, which are which each have a governor over them. And this is how the Achaemenid Empire is administrated. Um, and of course, one of those territories was called Armenia and exists in most of historic Armenia, but includes areas to the north, like what's now modern Georgia, and some areas to the west, right? It, expends, it extends a little bit further west than we've seen Armenia extend, extend before. Now, during the Achaemenid period, there was, at, at least at first, um, a positive relationship between the Armenians and uh, the Persians uh, who are ruling over them. So like, for example, you can see on the left-hand side, you have Tigranes Yervanduni. Um, Yervanduni uh, was an Armenian prince and he was a famous hunting partner of King Cyrus the Great. Um, so he, uh, yeah, so he was involved um, in going on hunts with Cyrus the Great, and they had a really strong and meaningful friendship uh, together as individuals and as royalty. Now, we also see that Armenia as a satrap has to provide tribute uh, to Persia. And in the upper right-hand side, you can see what that tribute looks like, right? The first thing that we notice immediately is the horses. Ar uh, as I pointed out before, Urartu had always been uh, providing horses when the Assyrians had made, uh, had made Armenia Urartu a vassal um, they were uh, always providing horses. Uh, so this doesn't uh, strike as much of a surprise. And you can also see a vessel of wine. Um, Armenia uh, was an area where grapes were grown and Armenian wine is still cultivated to this day. Um, in post-Soviet Armenia, there are unique grapes that don't exist anywhere else in the grape cultivating world. So if you can, if you can try our Armenian red wines, uh, it's a unique experience. Um, and uh, 
sort of in response to the earlier question, uh, this is an Armenian soldier from the tomb of King Xerxes. With There were other soldiers who were holding up the tomb, right? One of the common motifs of the Persians, after they had conquered this large empire, was to show themselves as what they called Shahan Shah, kings of kings, where they consider themselves the rulers of the universe. And within that universe, there were numerous different kingdoms of different nationalities that they had brought together in their own sort of united nations, right? So they would have symbols of all these different nations working together uh, in the Persian Empire. Um, one of yeah, one of the things that uh, we hadn't mentioned yet is that right by the time of the fall of Urartu, the dominant language we see in what's now the satrap of Armenia is now the Armenian language. It's old Armenian, and it's not the same as modern Armenian, but it is clearly the ancestor of modern Armenian. And this differs from the inscriptions that we have from earlier periods in Urartu, where we have inscriptions that are clearly in Hurrian. They're using the Akkadian alphabet, so we can so we know how to read them, but the language is clearly not Armenian. Um, so, of course, the question is, linguistically, is it that the Armenians just showed up where the Urartuans were? Were they a replacement people? Or had they been living in the region for a longer period of time? Um, were they a dominant part of the region? Were they a secondary part of the region? Um, were they one member of the confederation? We talked about how the Nairi were a number of different confederations. So, um, so it may have been any of those answers. We, we really don't know. Um, most uh, Armenians would say that Armenians were part of Urartu since the beginning, if not the dominant part. And uh, those who are generally opposed to Armenian historiography um, will say that Armenians really only show up on the historical record after the fall of Urartu. So now we get into the development of a new religion in Armenia, right? We had this religion of Khaldi, which prevailed during the Urartuan period, but now with Persian influence, we begin to see the rising of a new Zoroastrian-esque religion. And I say esque because it's not the Zoroastrianism that's practiced in Iran at this time. It has some of its features, but other ones that are completely different. So um, what the first thing to notice is on the right-hand side, we have this great King Armazd. Armazd is a hybridization, right, of the name Arame, right, that first King of Urartu, and Ormuzd, or Ahura Mazda which was the name of the Persian, uh, of the Zoroastrian supreme deity, right? And Armazd was sort of the quintessential Armenian powerful knight. And you can see him dressed up in a kingly robe and attire, riding astride a horse. And uh, similar to uh, Zeus in many ways, you can imagine, he is the god of, uh, the king of the gods, the most powerful one, um, master of uh, storms, um, and the central aspect of power. Now, part of the piece that came in from the Zoroastrian belief was that Ahura Mazda was the god of goodness, right? The god, the creator god, the god who wanted to bring about goodness in the world. And so Armaz also had this nature, right? He was a good uh, creator deity, and he wanted to protect the Armenian people. Hey, Richard. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Could I could I, could I just um, ask a a question absolutely um i i've heard someone say that um ahura mazda first uh, it's actually two questions really i've heard um uh some iranian scholars compare ahura mazda to more to prometheus than to zeus um and you know um also the temple at garni is, is uh, a Mithraic temple. And I think Mithraism is more like a pagan religion that preceded maybe monolatrous, but that is distinct from Zoroastrianism. Um, sure. That, yeah. um, the, the point that I, I would agree with you that Ahura Mazda is not like Zeus. Armazd is, right? The the Armenian Zoroastrianism is a different religion, right? It's, it's in the same way that um, Nation of Islam in the United States is not okay. the same thing as Sunni Islam, right? There, there are functionally different identities, and there's definitely influence from so Sunni the way Islam that the on the 
the what? Sassanids. Uh, sorry, sort of the way that the that Audishir, the founder of the Sassanid dynasty, identified Ormazd or Hormazda with Zeus, despite that not being the case in Zoroastrianism prior. I get what Correct. you're saying. Correct. Correct. Um, as to uh, the Temple of Garni being Mithraic, um, it's had different uses at different periods in time. So it was both Mithraic and uh, Armenian Zoroastrian at different moments. It depended on who controlled the temple. Um, so, Thanks. yeah. Um, so you have this Armas, you have this uh, chief uh, deity, and you also have a number of local Armenian deities as well. Right in proper Zoroastrianism, Ahura Mazda is the only god, and there are other uh, divine beings that are of lesser power, um, but these are not gods. This is a difference between uh, Zoroastrianism and Armenian Zoroastrianism. Um, in Armenian Zoroastrianism, there are multiple gods, and so Anahit is the goddess of uh, fertility. You have Vahag, who is the god of fire, war, and war. You can see him there dueling two dragons. Uh, you have Nane who is the goddess of wisdom and of the heart, sort of Athena and Hestia uh, sort of rolled into one. Um, and you also have the god uh, Astrik, um, and Astrik uh, is the goddess of water. And still today in Armenia, uh, a festival in her honor, which is usually celebrated in July, um, is the festival of Vardavar, where Armenians throw water at each other, right? Um, so, there are still elements of Armenian Zoroastrianism that survive to the present day. And as we mentioned, Temple Garni is the only polytheistic temple that survives in post-Soviet Armenia. Most of um, the temples from this time period um, were destroyed during, uh, during later, uh, later periods. We'll talk about that. But um, so this is, this is really the only uh, example we have of pre-Christian uh, Armenian religious uh, behavior that's still set in stone. All right, so we then move a little bit later in time and Persia has consolidated its power over the course of a century and a half and they really control uh, this Anatolian region. Um, and a number of the different satraps um, were feeling that they weren't given their proper due by uh, the great emperor in Persepolis. So um, the first one to revolt is um, uh, Datames of uh, Cappadocia, and he is supported by Ariobarzanes of Phrygia. Um, and those two uh, rebel with the help of Orantes of Armenia, right? So you have these satraps who are raising up their local armies to oppose the Persians. It is a massive internal rebellion. And this is relatively surprising um, for uh, the Persian kings at the time, because Orontes himself had already been fighting on behalf of the Persians to subdue an uprising in Cyprus. But uh, Orontes had felt that he wasn't, he wasn't properly um, uh, compensated for uh, the great work that he had done in, in, in supporting the empire. And so he was willing to join this revolt by uh, Ariobazanes and Datames. They were also supported by a third foreign power, right? You've got uh, Pharaoh Nectanebo. Uh, Egypt had some degree of autonomy at this point, and the pharaohs of Egypt were trying to uh, do anything to remove Persian control from Egypt. And so supporting these kinds of rebellions uh, elsewhere in the Persian empire would be a net benefit to Egypt. So you had Egyptian support as well. Orontes, however, um, made the bold move of betraying the rebellion in its final year. Um, uh, had, uh, and after he betrayed them, he was richly rewarded um, by the Persian kings um, and uh, Ariobarzanes and Datames were both executed. This area um, effectively remained part of Persia until it would be conquered by the Greeks uh, sorry, the Macedonian Greeks under Philip uh, under Alexander the Great uh, in about thirty years. So, if you look on the lower right hand side, right, you have the Battle of Gaugamela, which was a, a battle that took place. Um, I have a question actually about Gobekli uh, uh, Tepe. Um, 
Gobekli Tepe, as far as I'm aware, is pre Urartuan. Um, so I wouldn't call that Armenian. It's it's whatever the civil like civilizations didn't have distinct ethnicities at that point. So um, I yeah I'd, I'd hesitate to call it anything more than just a human civilization. So the Battle of Galgamela was a decisive victory by Alexander the Great against the Persians. And in this battle, there were Armenian commanders on the um, on the Persian side. But after the Persian uh, defeat at the Battle of Galgamela, they retreated to Armenia, right? And they were led by the former Persian commander, uh, Orontes II. Um, one of the things, and I apologize for this in advance, is that many of these people have very similar names to each other. Um, and so if you get confused by the names, you're not alone. Um, so this is the second Orontes, not the first Orontes. Um, so Orontes the second of Armenia, and he builds this Mount Nimrut, um, which is you can still see in modern day Turkey, um, which shows his connection to uh, historic Armenian kings, um, as well, uh, and uh, several noble families in Persia as well, right? Because he had to justify his right to kingship. Now, the reason I say this is that when Alexander the Great was alive, Armenia was going to certainly be part of his empire. But when uh, you had, when you start having uh, fights between Alexander's generals after Alexander the Great dies in Babylon, um, Armenia being at the very edge of this empire manages to become effectively independent. So in 321, Orontes II declares himself a king of an independent greater Armenia. So you can see what that looks like on this map here. And that kingdom exists for nearly 180 years. Its primary opposition was from the Seleucid Empire, right? We uh, After the uh, the collapse of Alexander the Great's empire, it collapsed into uh, different pieces owned by different generals. The largest one by far was that controlled by the general Seleucus, and that was the one that spanned most of uh, most of the Asian part of Alexander the Great's empire. You can see in the light blue the area that the third uh, king of the Seleucid uh, dynasty, uh, Antiochus III, uh, inherited for when he came to power, and the dark blue area are those areas that he conquered. Now, you can see that he conquers Armenia um, in uh, during his reign, and um, Armenia was now uh, forced to, yeah, uh, once it was conquered, it became part of the Seleucid Empire. Prior to that, you can see you had Greater Armenia, this sort of uh, brown country, and you also had Sofene and Komagene, which are two um, Armenian majority regions that had already been part of the Seleucid uh, Seleucid uh, Empire. So now the arrival of the Seleucids led to a large scale Hellenization um, in Armenia. Um, and there was some pushback um, from those worshipers of Armenian Zoroastrianism um, against this Hellenization. So, but in the end, this ended up creating a, a strong relationship between Armenians and uh, the various dynasties uh, that surrounded them among both the Seleucids and Romans. So once we get to 160 BCE, we have this very interesting situation where the Romans are beginning to make headway against the Seleucids and they find an ally in the Armenians, right? Um, the Armenians can serve as a pincer against the Seleucids. And because of this, Artaxias I in 189 is able to create a new Armenian dynasty and he creates a capital at Artashat. You can see um, uh, Artashat is the Armenian name, Artaxata is the Greek name. Uh, and you can see on the map of post-Soviet Armenia, where this city is. It's actually very close to Yerevan. Um, and he builds this city as uh, sort of a citadel on a hill. King Artaxias is able to 
reconquer most of the area of uh, historic Armenia and create a relatively large empire to counterbalance uh, the Seleucids, Seleucids and uh, prevent full-scale Hellenization of the region. But the empire really reaches its height under King Tigranes the Great, who ruled about a hundred years later. Now Tigranes, of course, when he comes to power, he's controlling the area on the map in orange. He's uh, based in Arthashat, right? That's his capital along the Araxis River. And um, he starts expanding his power by bringing in first Sofene, um, and later by making vassal states out of all of the kingdoms to his direct south, right? Uh, of the Median, of the Medians, of Atropatene, of Adiabene, which is a new Assyrian country, Osroene, another Assyrian country. And he then sends his army even further um, to conquer the area of Syria all the way down uh, to the southern part of Lebanon and getting Judea and Cappadocia as his vassals. Um, now, this strained relations between the Armenians and the Romans, their historic allies, right, because Rome was trying to expand into this region as well. However, Tigranes was actually relatively good until, uh, until what well, we're going to talk about in a few seconds, in maintaining positive and fruitful relations with the Romans, and it looked like he might actually be able to hold on to this large empire um, with Roman support. But unfortunately, um, Tigranes was married to the daughter of Mithridates. Mithridates was the king of the Pontus. You can see on the map on the right-hand side, the Pontus is the area in the dark purple. And they were a border kingdom of Armenia. Now, King Mithridates um, was implac an implacable enemy of Rome and had gotten into wars with Rome called the Mithridatic Wars between 88 and 63 BC. Now, these wars were incredibly devastating um, to the kingdom of the Pontus. They had initial victories, but were eventually completely crushed by the Romans. But they would have spillover effects for the Armenians because Tigranes uh, allied with his father-in-law against the Romans um, in these Mithridatic Wars. The decisive victory for the Romans came at the Battle of Tigranacert uh, uh, or Tigranocerta in, in Latin. Um, and at this battle, um, Tigranus's forces were substantially defeated. He had to give up all of the territory he had conquered in, and the vassal states and could only control his historic area of Armenia following this war. So we then, after though, Armenia remained a tributary of Rome and maintained good relations uh, with the Romans, more or less. You then have uh, the numerous uh, altercations between the Roman Empire and the Parthian Empire. As the Roman Empire has taken over the Western part of the Middle East, the Levant and uh, Asia Minor, they have now have a direct border with the Parthians over uh, the over the deserts that separate Jordan and Iraq today, and they have an indirect border through the Kingdom of Armenia. And Armenia felt itself particularly situated to be the transitory uh, and trading partner of both Parthia and the Romans, even though they were more in the Roman sphere than the Parthian sphere. And the Parthians were relatively willing to accept this. There were wars uh, on occasion against Armenia from the Parthians, um, but generally speaking, they respected the sovereignty of the kingdom of Armenia. Now, when the Romans wanted to engage the Parthians, uh, they were led by a man named Marcus Crassus, who believed that he would be able to defeat the Parthians and then use the territory and glory from having won that victory to then turn and conquer the Roman Empire from several rival factions, right? Because uh, he was Roman, but there were rival factions that he wanted to remove and therefore secure his position as emperor. And King Artavastes II of Armenia pledged Armenian swords and Armenian horses um, to fight alongside the Romans against the Parthians. And Crassus refused any help from the Armenians 
and refused to use their territory as an overground way to get to the Parthian Empire. So he crossed through the desert and arrived in the Parthian Empire um, very close to, uh, in what's now Iraq. So when they got there, the Parthians attacked and the majority of the Parthian forces were lightly armed cavalry. We've, uh, if, if you've been in previous of uh, these presentations, you've known that lightly armed cavalry tend to, be, tend to be the dominant force of anybody who comes from the steppes and the Parthians come from the northern edge of Iran, very close to Central Asia. So that's naturally in their wheelhouse. In order to protect themselves, the Romans formed a square and you can see that sort of in the image in the lower left-hand side, the edge of the square, where the soldiers are putting up shields to protect themselves as the cavalry encircle them. Um, King, uh, King of Kings Orodes II of Parthia um, commanded uh, the assault on the Romans. And every time the Romans would step out from the square, they would get completely harassed and bullied um, by, the, by these Parthians. Um, and even when they were able to put up their shields, some arrows would get through. So it was a war of attrition that the Romans had no way of winning. Um, and it only came to an end when Marcus Crassus himself was killed by the Parthians um, and uh, the Romans had to sign an ignominious peace uh, with them. So the Romans, it seems, had learned their lesson from the Battle of Carhe. And so the next time that uh, they came over, I apologize for the map being in Russian. Um, I literally could not find a map in English. Um, so they think uh, we think that they had won their uh, uh, figured out their lesson, um, and so I don't know why Armenia is the same color as Rome because they clearly not a part of Rome, but uh, the Roman forces come through Armenia um, and launch another attack at Parthia, at the city of uh, uh, Farasna, uh, Faraspa, sorry, um, and. This ends up being another loss for the Romans, but this time um, it's Mark Antony leading the charge. And he not only asks Artavastes uh, the second to lend him uh, horses and swords, uh, he demands it. So, um, so the forces entered uh, Parthia. And one of the main problems is that the um, siege weaponry that would have been used in Parthia took a different route from the soldiers and the siege weaponry was destroyed by the Parthian light cavalry. And then at the battle of uh, Frasna, without those uh, heavy siege weaponry and without the ability to form a Tetsudo, which is the, the military formation that the Romans do where their shields all line, the Romans were routed uh, quite thoroughly uh, from the battlefield. And so Mark Antony, rather than blame his own tactical failures, um, arrested uh, Artavastes and brought him to his lover Cleopatra in Alexandria. The reason he brought him to her is because she was one of the major financiers of the war, um, and he wanted uh, and he wanted to uh, lay blame for his failure uh, on Artavastes instead of on himself. So um, Artavastes would soon be executed by Cleopatra. But the, as, as I pointed out, the Parthian campaign was unsuccessful and Parthia remained an enemy of the Romans uh, from that point onwards. That said, Armenia became more and more connected to the Roman Empire as time went forward. So we can see um, by 62 CE, uh, Trajan um, has brought Armenia into the wider, sorry, Emperor Nero, has brought um, Armenia into vassalhood with, uh, with Rome. And you can see uh, the crowning of Tiridates I in 62, um, Emperor Nero crowning the, the Armenian king. Between the years 1114 and 1118, Armenia was um, brought in as a full province of the Roman Empire. It would lose that status in 118 when it became quasi-independent again. Now, at this time, 
uh, we have a major sea change going on in the Parthian Empire. Um, from the region of Fars, which is in that southwestern region, a very mountainous region of Iran, we have a new um, group of uh, rulers. These are the Sassanids. And, the, uh, and we've talked about them before. We mentioned them in uh, lecture two because um, we're sort of catching up to where we were at that point. Um, and the Sassanids were uh, Zorvite uh, Zoroastrians, um, incredibly pious, and they considered themselves the return of the Achaemenids, right? They saw the Parthians as these nomadic uh, invaders and usurpers who had taken over um, the Achaemenid Empire in the wake of the Hellenization of the Seleucids, and that things should be returned to the way that they were um, prior to this point. So um, they began to develop a system of nobility called the Dakon, um, and um, they began to use symbols and uh, represent representations that showed themselves to be the successors to the Achaemenids. At this same time, we see a fundamental change in Armenia. As we move through the third century, um, sorry, yeah, as we move through the third century, um, we have King uh, Tiridates III. Um, no, sorry, uh, as, as we move through the third century, we have uh, King Khosrow II, and he is assassinated by Anak. Uh, and, and Anak is um, a uh, assassin sent by the Sassanids um, because uh, Khosrow II uh, was not pliant enough to Sassanid demands, right? Sa the Sassanids are beginning to uh, put increased pressure on the kingdom of Armenia uh, to submit uh, to them. Um, and Anak manages to murder all of Khosrow of the Second's family, except for his infant son, Tiridates. Tiridates is ra is, uh, is, manages to escape and is raised in Rome. Um, and he becomes qu uh, very close friends with Emperor Diocletian of the Romans. Both of them were very much anti-Christian um, and they saw this new religion uh, spreading in their empire as a serious problem. Um, and that ended up binding them when Tiridates was appointed to be king of, uh, a king of Armenia. And so you had large scale uh, repression of the new Christian religion that was spreading in Armenia. And you also had, um, and Tiridates himself was a believer in uh, Armenian Zoroastrianism. So uh, among his staff was one of the only living descendants of Anak, wh whose name was Gregory. Now Gregory had been taken from Anak um, and brought to Cappadocia where he grew up as a Christian. Um, and Gregory himself um, believed that his that his conversion to Christianity was his only act of grace that allowed him to rise above the horror that Anak had inflicted on the Armenian people. And he saw his duty as penance to work for King Tiridates in, um, in maintaining his country um, as sort of recompense for what his ancestor Anak had done in destroying Armenia. When Tiridates discovered that Gregory was a Christian, he had him imprisoned in the in the deep pit of Khorvirap, you can see uh, that deep pit is preserved to this day underneath the monastery that's there um, on the lower right-hand side. And um, he was imprisoned there for nearly 19 years until King Tiridates had um, a sickness that uh, could not be cured and was willing to try any means uh, to resolve it. His sister, Khosrovidocht, um, told him that he should consult with Gregory. The, uh, he should consult with Gregory, and Gregory could invoke the will of his God to perhaps save Tiridates. Listening to this advice, he brought Gregory to him, and uh, Gregory, through his magical abilities granted to him by God, was able to cure um, Tiridates the Third. Now, this led to Tiridates um, throwing back his relationship um, with, uh, sorry, changing his relationship with Christianity completely. He, uh, he got baptized on the spot and decided that all of Armenia now had to convert to Christianity. So rather than becoming 
uh, ecumenical and understanding a, a vast variety of religions could exist in Armenia, he became extremely uh, anti uh, uh, against the Roman religion and against Armenian Zoroastrianism. Um, and this caused a number of conflicts with the Sasanians as they were increasingly pro-Zoroastrian. You also had a number of Armenians fleeing the country to Persia in order to escape these new um, uh, persecutions against Armenian non-Christians. At the same time, you also have the story of uh, Saint Tripsime. Um, she was a Christian virgin um, who was ordered to have uh, sex with a non-Christian king, and she refused for she was execu executed and became a saint. Because uh, the king that she refused to have sex with was Tiridates in his non-Christian face, um, she has been canonized as a saint of the Armenian Apostolic Church. So when we have the Christianization of Armenia, we then begin to have the creation of the Holy Catholicos of the Armenians. And by Catholicos, we mean the representation of the Armenian church in the singular person. Um, the Catholicos, for example, of the Roman Catholic church is the Pope, right? Um, so you have a Catholicos who also represents the Armenian Apostolic Church. And um, rulers subsequent to uh, Tiridatis began to build um, in Vakar Shapat, which is in modern day Arme um, uh, in post-Soviet Armenia, um, they built in Vagar Shapat this uh, great seminary called Echmiazdin. Uh, and Echmiazdin um, is, uh, yeah, Echmiazdin is this large complex, very similar to the Vatican, with numerous church buildings and centers um, to organize the Armenian church. Uh, the picture in the upper left-hand side is the what is the main cathedral that people are most familiar with in Ejmiadzin, um, but there are a number of other churches, as you can see here. Now, through the later centuries, we also have the development of other cathedrals throughout um, post-Soviet Armenia, as well as in what's now uh, Turkey and Iran and Azerbaijan. Unfortunately, with the exception of Azerbaijan, uh, with the exception of Iran, uh, these countries have been hostile to Armenian structures, and so most of them do not survive to the present day. The ones in uh, post-Soviet Armenia, however, do survive. And so, for example, we have Zvartnats Cathedral, of which only the lower columns are surviving. You can see uh, imagined reconstructions in the lower right-hand side of what that cathedral would have looked like. We have uh, Gerard Monastery, um, which is, as you can see, literally carved out of the mountainside. Um, and if you look very closely at the image on the right-hand side, we'll talk about this a little bit more in depth, you can see the tombstones also carved into the mountain. You also have a number of other medieval monasteries uh, all throughout the uh, all throughout the country. Um, you can see in the upper left-hand side, you have Khorbirap, which is a monastery that was built on top of where Gregory was imprisoned in that deep pit to commemorate that experience. Um, and in the mid third century, we have the construction of a new Armenian capital. So the capital moves from Vagar Shabbat to this new state uh, capital of Dvin, um, which is, somewhere near Artasha, which is somehow between Yerevan and Artasha. Um, and Devin is located along the Araxis River and is built on a plateau above it. So you can see that there's a citadel in the center of the city and the majority of the city separate from that. Um, this capital city became an incredibly holy and special place for Armenians um, for several centuries. And the Catholicos moved from uh, Echmiadzin uh, to uh, Dvin, um, it would eventually make its way back to Echmiadzin um, in the 20th century. But um, before, uh, but uh, in the intermediate period, it moved to several different cities, and Dvin is one of those cities. So we then 
see in the early in the early fifth century the development of Armenian identity uh, in a more crystallized way around the church structures. Um, probably the most uh, important aspect here is the creation of the Armenian alphabet. The Armenian alphabet was a creation by uh, a monk named Mesh, uh, Mesrop Meshtots, and the reason for which he created this alphabet was to render the Bible in the Armenian language. Bibles already existed in, Arme in Armenia in, in Greek and in Syriac, Syriac is a version of medieval Aramaic, um, but most Armenians didn't speak those languages, and um, Mesrop Mashtots wanted the, the Bible to be accessible to all Armenians, um, and therefore they could all be converted to Christianity. And so he created this alphabet, which is a purely phonetic alphabet, and corresponds to all of the phonemes in the Armenian language. Now, as you can see from the table on the left-hand side, in Eastern Armenian and in Western Armenian, these phonemes and these have different pronunciations as those have diverged over time. Um, so a lot of the names of places, for example, uh, Echmiadzin and Echmiadzin, right? Which have slightly different pronunciations, right? Um, are a result of Armenians reading these letters differently, not them using different letters to describe the same thing. So um, you, can, uh, you can see the first sentence that was used to prove that this uh, alphabet worked for transliterating Armenian, um, which was Proverbs 1-2, to know wisdom and instruction to perceive the words of understanding, which of course was specifically chosen in order to demonstrate the goal of writing down Armenian, which was to transmit knowledge and information, uh, namely the liturgical texts. But it wasn't just those that survived. One of uh, Mashtot's uh, students was Moses Khorenatsi, uh, better known in the West as Moses of Korene, and, or Moses of Chorin. Um, and he is called by the Armenians as Pat Mahair, or the father of their history. And um, Mofsis Khorenatsi is one of the best sources we have for all Armenian history prior to uh, the year 400. Um, a lot of the stories that I've been telling you um, concerning Armenian individuals like Tigranes Yevanduni uh, or concerning the Urartu civilization or uh, King Ara and uh, Semiramis, um, all these were written by Mofsis Khorenatsi. Now, during this period, we also have the development of art forms that center around the Armenian alphabet. One in particular is what's called Tirchnagir, uh, sorry, Tirchnagir. And Tirchnagir um, is the bird alphabet, for want of a better term. And it's immortalizing the letters of the uh, Armenian alphabet in birds or in animals or in other um, living creatures um, to sort of give life uh, and shape to those letters. The fact that many of these letters are curved uh, in intensely helps with this. Okay. We also see the development of a very uniquely Armenian um, cultural attribute during this period, which is what's called the Khachkar. The Khachkar is an engraved funeral stele um, or funeral stone, um, and it sits above a grave of a person. Armenians like Christianity teaches bury their dead. Um, and each Khachkar is unique and carved specifically for whoever the person was who is deceased. Um, and you can see Khachkars come in different sizes, shapes, colors. Some of them, like the ones in the lower right hand side, are carved right into the mountainside. Some of them are in graveyards. Some of them are outside of monasteries. And where any Armenian community has lived for a long period of time, you will see these Khachkar. Unfortunately, um, not all regions of the world have protected them. And the Khachkar you see in the upper right-hand side are Khachkar that no longer exist because they were destroyed by the Azerbaijani government. All right. During this period also, we see large-scale Armenian trade. Armenia is always known uh, for being a trading hub. Um, and you have what are called caravanserai, which are 
um, palaces for um, people to come and uh, from long away. They have areas where both humans and lot and horses or camels um, can stay and eat for a night or two before going on to their next destination. Um, the Armenians, um, it seems sort of counterintuitive, but when the Armenians did control areas by the water, they became shipbuilders. Um, during Tigran the Great, we have numerous coins uh, in, our, uh, in Armenian circulation showing that they were intensely involved in the economies of the countries that bordered them. Um, and um, we have numerous uh, documents in the Roman Empire explaining that most of the silk that they got from China passed through Armenia. So we start moving into this period where the king of Armenia uh, becomes less and less popular with uh, the local uh, population. So um, the Nakharar or the Armenian nobles um, petition the Sassanid king uh, Shayazdagir II to overthrow, um, yeah, to overthrow um, the king of, uh, so, yeah, to overthrow the king of Armenia and to institute what's called the Marban, or the Persian governor of Armenia. Um, the Nakharar believed that they could work with this Marzban and have more autonomy of their own, right? One of the things that we're gonna to continue to see with the Armenians is a lack of unity among the various Armenian groups. Um, and in this case, it's the noble families um, of Armenia who are uh, uninterested in the way that the king, the Arsacid king was ruling. So um, you have these Marzban that begin to move to Tvin, which is still the capital. And the first one is Vemir Shapur. You can see him in the upper right-hand side. But after that, Shah Yazdagir is very angry with the Armenian embrace of Christianity, but not that it's Christianity per se, not Christianity per se, but um, because within the Persian empire, the Christian religion was recognized as a legitimate religion, but it was the Church of the East, right? This is the what's today called the Assyrian Church of the East, and it's a church that's based among Aramaic-speaking peoples in the northern part of Iraq and in Syria, which is a completely different part of the church than what the Armenians belong to under their Armenian Apostolic Church. And the Armenian Apostolic Church was a church outside of Shah Yazdegerd's control, and so he began to uh, enforce more militant control of Armenia to try and forcibly convince Armenia back to become Zoroastrian. At this same time, Albania, uh, Iberia, uh, Albania and Iberia, Iberia being a Georgian kingdom, Albania being one of the forerunners of modern Azerbaijan, both of these countries were also converting to Christianity and similarly had issues with the Persians who were at this point Zoroastrian fundamentalist. So when we say that they're Zoroastrian fundamentalist, what, what, what do we mean by this? Um, we have Zoroastrians who are incorporated into the clerical and organizational establishment of the empire and um, areas where Christianity exists are seen as areas that are likely to end up as traitors. So we have the recognition of um, the Assyrian Church of the East specifically because that church was expelled by the Roman Empire. But any church that has functional relations with the Romans um, was seen as a possible enemy of the state. And so these Zoroastrians were able to have a large scale effect on political policy and unlike the Achaemenids who were sort of live and let live with their Zoroastrianism, they didn't try and convert people um, more or less. Um, the Zurvaite philosophy of Zoroastrianism that the Sassanids followed was very much in favor of forced conversions and forced um, organization under uh, a Zoroastrian mantle. Okay. Um, and so throughout the fourth century, we start to have wars between uh, Zoroastrians, um, both from Persia itself and 
uh, live those living in Armenia and those who are loyal to the Armenian church. So um, one particular example is that King Arshak II um, of, of Armenia is taken uh, hostage by the Persians. Uh, he's taken to the castle of Oblivion, by the way, great name. Um, so he's, they're, they're taken to the castle of Oblivion, uh, which is in the region of Khuzestan uh, of today, it's southwestern Iran. And he, and he is permitted one visitor, uh, this man by the name of Drastamat. Um, and when Drastamat sees King Arshak um, and how horrible Arshak's life is, um, he also witnesses Arshak commit suicide um, and, because he just couldn't stand the possibility of never returning to Armenia. And so Drastamat commits suicide upon seeing King Arshak II uh, committing suicide. Um, we also have, for example, tribal con uh, conflicts between the nobility. We talked about the Nakharar, right? These uh, Armenian nobles who have their own um, intuitions about how the country should be governed. And so we have Merzuhan Artsruni. Uh, Arts uh, Merzuhan Artsruni uh, comes from the Artsruni family. And he was a committed Zoroastrian. He believed in the Zoroastrian religion and refused to convert. He became a vassal of the Persian Empire. And you can see um, that Christians, uh, Christian leadership that managed to uh, uh, get him in 381, um, they, took a, uh, they took a spear and they bent it in the fire to turn it into a sort of a crown almost you could imagine. And they heated it up until it was nearly molten and they put it on his head to burn him through execution, right? Um, in most, most Armenians today consider uh, Merzuhan Otsruni to be a traitor for being supportive of Zoroastrian uh, ideology, uh, Zor sorry, Zoroastrian religion. And, um, but of course, this was an act of Christian brutality against a Zoroastrian. All right. So this religious issue would not be resolved until the end of until the end of the fifth century. So we start having a number of different uh, revolts that culminate in 451 with the Battle of, Avare of Avarayar. In this battle, another Nakharar, Varda Mamikonian, uh, leads, um, uh, leads the Armenian forces into battle with the Persians. And the Battle of Avarayar is a decisive defeat for the Armenians led by Mamikonian, uh, Mamikonian is, uh, Varda Mamikonian is killed, um, and the Armenians are required to pay tribute to the Persians. However, the Persians don't capitalize on their victory because they have issues on their eastern front. So in one of the it's one of the things that we haven't really talked about in this session. We talked about it a lot um, in my uh, lecture on the Huns, and we talked about it a little bit um, when we talked about uh, the second lecture, the history of the Sassanids. Um, you had a conflict with the Hephthalites, who were a type of Hun that existed in what's now Afghanistan and Turkmenistan. And these Hephthalites were incredibly powerful in that they had a mastery of light cavalry. So these Hephthalites fought a war with the Sasanians, and they even killed the Shah, the King of Kings of the Persian Empire, Piroz I. Now, in order to deal with uh, to deal with this problem, they, uh, the Persians realized that they needed to make peace with the Armenians and perhaps bring a coalition of Armenians to fight against the Hephthalites. So Vahan Mamikonian, a, um, a relative of Vardan, was called to Devin by the Persians to sign what was called the Treaty of Navarsak in 484. And that Treaty of Navarsak would give Armenia the ability to practice Christianity without any limitation, um, and this allowed Christianity to survive in Armenia. Vahan Mamikonian and Varda Mamikonian are seen as national heroes by the Armenians. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention, and you can see the war elephants in the upper left-hand side, This, uh, the Battle of Avarayar is very famous for the Persians bringing war elephants uh, to the battle, which incredibly, uh, which was incredibly scary to the Armenians since they had no experience in fighting elephants and was one of the reasons they lost so decisively. So 
one of the fun things about uh, religion, especially Christianity in this early period, is that there is an incredible amount of Christian sectarianism that's going on. So the idea of a unified Christianity is not happening at this time. And you have the counts of the, the ecumenical councils. In the third ecumenical council, that was when the Nestorian church was thrown out, the Nestorian church being the church of the East that was recognized by the Sassanids. And um, it was in the fourth ecumenical council, which took place in 451, where the Armenians separated from the Roman Catholic church and from the Orthodox church. Um, it's important to remember that 451 was also the year of the Battle of Avareir, which meant that the Armenians didn't send a delegation to the fourth council and only rejected it um, 60, uh, sorry, 55 years later at Dvin. So, um, but the, the Council of Chalcedon was about the question of Jesus's nature. Was Jesus a entity that had two natures, one divine and one human, and those two natures were two distinct separate entities that fused together into one being? Or was it the case that Jesus's, uh, Jesus's two natures of humanity and divinity were so intertwined that it would be impossible to distinguish them? Right. This was really the debate of the Fourth Council of Chalcedon. Um, the Christians are going to kill me, but this is the simplest way I can imagine it. Imagine the difference between salt water and an oil slick, right? You can't understand an oil slick without both the oil and the water, but the oil and water are clearly differentiable entities within the oil slickness. Salt water has salt and water, but those entities are not differentiable. You can't pull the salt out of the water. Um, so the Armenians, for want of a better term, supported salt water Jesus, and the uh, Roman Catholics and Orthodox supported oil slick Jesus. Uh, and this, of course, was such a massive difference in thought that it required numerous wars and antipathy between the sides for, you know, uh, 1500 years um, over, over this, you know, high level of complexity. Um, we're getting close to the witching hour. I think this is actually um, a good place to stop. Um, and we'll pick we'll pick up this part uh, next week. Um, does anybody have any questions or uh, comments that they'd like to make? Yeah, very good presentation, uh, Richard. I, I like how you you framed the theological conflict at the end. So, <laughs> thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Patty. I see I see you have a hand raised. I just want to say that's the smartest way to compare the salt water and oil and water. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, Patty? Yeah, I think the same thing. I think that was a fabulous and thoughtful analogy. Um, I need to think about that more. I want to start off by apologizing. I feel profoundly ignorant about most of what you're trying to teach us. It's a combination of the language and um, the constantly evolving geography. So that's one question. Do you have a, any recommendation um, on a source of maps that um, like where I had to go back and, and watch the YouTube of this um, that I can refer to because some of this is not as large as I would like it to be on my screen. So that's one question. Yeah. All right. So let, wait, uh, let me start there. Um, in terms of maps of the region, um, there's a website called Armenica. Um, and, yeah, like America and Armenia had a baby, right? Armenica. Yeah. Um, so this website has a large category of maps that focus on Armenia as I'm describing it here, right? This area that you can actually see right now, right? That covers what's now Eastern Turkey um, and parts of the Caucasus, right? Because Armenia is much bigger than the current Republic of Armenia. And so that creates a lot of confusion. I think another a serious point, and I think you brought it up really well, is the language issue. Um, a lot of these cities have been named and renamed and supernamed. And like, for example, if you look on the map that I have currently in front of you, you see in one of the circles, it says Edessa. Edessa is not known by that name anymore. It's known by the name Urfa. And it, the name Urfa hasn't been used in about a hundred years because it was renamed by Atatürk as Urfa. So if you're looking at a map and you're, 
or another one of the cities in this uh, that I have here uh, is Theodosiopoulos. And, and Theodosiopoulos is now known as the city of Erzurum. Right. Mm -hmm. So you've got a lot of naming and renaming and super naming uh, that goes on here. So it does take a while to acculturate yourself to sort of seeing where a city is and realizing that that's the name for it. I've tried as best as I can to use names consistently uh, in my presentation. So that way it's easier to follow. Um, but if you look at maps just out of the corner of your eye, it, it could easily slip past you. And what was your second question? Well, I want to thank you because I was feeling very ignorant and you brought perfectly together what my sense of ignorance is. So thank you very much for that. And again, apologizing for my ignorance, at which I agree to. I mean, um, Not a problem. My sense is and has been of this general area of the world that there's a profound kind of... Um, tribalism that underlies a great deal of what happens. And I'm not sure if I'm understanding that properly. And again, if anyone finds that uh, no, an insulting um, kind of analysis, no, I apologize. No, that's, uh, um, it's actually very funny. I remember I was talking to several Native Americans and they find the use of the word tribe to be either insulting or, uh, or diminishing. They prefer the term nation or, uh, or community or something other than tribe because they have connotations of what that means in a Western context. Um, the, uh, although the thing is, is that in the Middle East, we use that term. Like in Arabic, the term is Kabila. Like people use that term repeatedly to refer to themselves and their ethnicity and their, and their identity. So the idea of tribalism is, is not um, offensive in any way to Middle Easterners. Um, and it's definitely a huge part of the politics here. As, as we pointed out several times, right? Um, one person will start a rebellion or start a revolution, just turn around and undo it um, <laughs> because it's it's more advantageous for them to uh, to do that. Um, there was another hand raised uh, spectrum. Yeah, hi, Richard. I, I put it in the text. I just thank you very much for such an informative talk. I look forward for the next one of this series and continuing with, uh, with the history into the 11 and 1200s. Thank you so much tonight. Yeah, thank you. Great it's job, Richard. Like usual. Um, I have a comment here that's asking to talk about Great Armenian job. art and calligraphy. Um, in terms of what survives of Armenian art, um, you have, as I pointed out, you have the Church Nagir. Uh, Church Nagir um, and the Church Nagir um, is... Uh, one of the most uh, common forms of Armenian art. There's also a lot of Armenian art that is religious in nature, right? That That is about the ornamentation and sculpture of the various buildings. Uh, if we go back a little bit, you can see the monasteries. If you notice very closely, all of the monasteries have an octagonal base to the cone that sits on their top. Um, and that octagonal base is one of the primary elements that, uh, that distinguishes Armenian cathedrals um, you also have that top sitting on top of four uh, rooftops. Um, again, that is another distinguishing feature, um, which makes it very easy on a first glance to immediately tell uh, that you're looking at an Armenian cathedral. So that uh, architecture is a huge element of Armenian art. Um, in many cases, you have um, silk works and, uh, and carpets that come from Armenia. Um, uh, the silk is not from Armenia. The silk is imported to Armenia, but the working of it is done in Armenia. Um, and uh, those generally tend to have more um, mosaic kind of patterns, uh, typically of what you would find, for example, in Islamic regions as well. Uh, uh, for those of you who know Arab carpets, this would be similar to a kilim. Um, yeah, so you've got all of these different elements going on. Uh, in terms of uh, the art. Uh, Enoch, was there anything else you wanted me to cover? Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, I, I had a quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, I, when Armenia converted to Christianity, uh, one of the things that I heard was that 
one of the motivations for it could have been nationalist motivations that the Ar Armenians wanted to resist Iran. So one, I mean, I wouldn't say that that's the only reason, but one of the reasons that they embraced Christianity was so they could, re and rejected Zoroastrianism was that because that was the religion of the Iranians and they wanted to be independent from Iran and not be under Persian imperial influence. I, I, I think I think there's definitely a lot of truth to that. Um, I would say more though that that came as a sort of direct result, right? You had this conversion to Christianity. It served to give them more independence because they had more independence. They further embraced the Christianity in order to create that sort of sense of national identity. Um, and I wanted to uh, point out while I uh, while I was speaking, um, we have a comment that uh, just to point out all of the churches that you can see here, Khorvirab. Uh, 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 what else is here? Noravank, uh, Tativ, uh, Sanahinavank. All of these are functioning uh, monasteries and churches in Armenia today. Um, yeah, they're absolutely beautiful. I recommend visiting them. All right. Uh, anything else, or uh, do we want to close this up for the night? Just to say that it was an, an amazing presentation, as usual. Thank you so much. So, uh, um, I have to ask you, you you have a day job as well? Yes, I'm a lawyer. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, I have a comment that uh, somebody's interested in the Cilician Crusader history. There's definitely going to be a discussion of that next week. Um, I, ha I have my slides. Uh, your, uh, and um, as Rob has pointed out, um, I am do I have a presentation for the Crusades that I've previously done um, as uh, episodes 10, 11, and 12 of my of my series. But uh, for Rob, I've decided to do a reprise, and it's going to be four 90-minute episodes um, that cover the same time period. Um, so um, you'll get to see it from the Crusader side as well. Um, I, have, I have a point that nationalism is a major part of Oriental Orthodox Christianity, and that's absolutely right. Um, Orthodox, both, e both Eastern Orthodoxy and Oriental Orthodoxy have a lot more to do with nationalism than, uh, than Roman Catholicism uh, does, and Protestantism, Protestantism to a lesser degree. Um, the Armenian language is not close to Greek. It is not close to any other Indo-European language. It, it is clearly an Indo-European language. Uh, linguistic studies have confirmed this uh, again and again, um, but uh, it is not close to Greek or uh, to any other uh, Romance language. Um, it's similar to Albanian in this way. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah, so I think I think that's it then. Very good. Yeah. All right. So, uh, Zach, do you have anything you want to say or? No, thank you, Richard. I appreciate it. This was really amazing as usual. Um, and as Richard pointed out, you know, in combination with Robert, we'll have uh, crusades in the European Union. Uh, so there's a lot of very exciting stuff. And so if you want to check out our uh, ancient most, uh, our in history, most ancient meetup or our YouTube channel, which is called History of Fitness Investing, Please do check it out. Please, you know, let us know. You know, also on Richard's videos, if you can, especially once a day, uh, do comment. Um, you know, ask questions and you know, and put likes. I mean, we won't be able to see dislikes, but you know, it is what it is. You know, as long as you make a comment, however it is, positive or negative, I don't see how there would be a dislikes. But um, we just want to hear us, you guys, engaged. And we're also on Facebook, Twitter, um, and it's called Omnicom, not to be confused with Omnicron. Uh, so, uh, and uh, please do join our, uh, so we can have a, like, you know, regular discussions on any topics and I'll be putting votes there to find out if you guys are interested in certain subject matters or whatnot. And then also check out our schedule on our website uh, again, it's omnicom.org. 
um, and then, you know, all the upcoming events. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you for everything you did. Thank you, Robert, for collaboration. And I'll see you, um, you know, on European Union presentation. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Great job, Richard, like usual. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thanks, Richard. Very good. Right. Thanks, Richard. Thank you very Richard. much, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. See you all later. Thank you all. All right.